In this video, we'll be making a comparison between the two most extreme forms of market structures, perfectly competitive markets against monopolies. So we have actually covered the characteristics of our most competitive market, perfectly competitive markets, in our video on an introduction to market structures. But I think it can't hurt just to go over those characteristics briefly again here. And so those characteristics are many buyers and sellers. So there are a large number of small firms all trying to sell their output to a large number of buyers. Those firms are producing homogenous products. So that means that the products that they are making and producing are completely identical from every single firm in that market. There are zero barriers to entry and exit. So it is completely costless for firms to move into that market and completely easily they can move into and then exit that market if they want to. And firms in that market are price takers. So they accept the going market price. And that price is going to be determined by the interaction of supply and demand, as we can see here. So this would be our market supply and this would be our market demand. And as we know from our supply and demand analysis, the price in that market would be made at the equilibrium point where supply is equal to demand. And then the individual firm would take that going market price and they would actually face a perfectly elastic demand curve for their individual firm because they are price takers. And so what that will mean is that profits are going to be much lower than in markets that are dominated by fewer large firms. And the reason for that is really down to this. And that is because if there are any sort of excess profits to be made by firms in perfectly competitive markets, then they're going to attract new firms into that market. And because there are no barriers to entry into the market, they're easily going to be able to come in and compete away those profits. So that really is what keeps those prices down at much lower levels than in markets that are dominated by fewer large firms, which generally have higher barriers to entry and exit. Now, at the other extreme from your perfectly competitive markets, you've got your markets which are termed as being monopolies. And in the purest sense, we call them pure monopolies. That's where there is just one single supplier, so one firm that exists in a market. And that would be really monopoly in the purest sense of the word. But that is very, very rare in real life. And so we refer to firms that have large enough market power or to firms that are large enough to exert significant enough influence and power on a market as having some form of monopoly power. And it might sound quite low, actually, but firms that have at least 25 percent of the market share of a particular market are seen as having some degree of monopoly power. And that's because if you think about 25 percent of an entire market, that's a quarter of the market owned and dominated by just one firm, which is quite a significant amount for that firm to then be able to exert a real influence over that market. And there are a few things which are going to influence the degree of monopoly power that individual firms are likely to be able to exert. And so a big part of that will be the extent of barriers to entry. And so these are things which make it difficult for new firms to come into the market and challenge the power of that one large firm. And there are a huge number of different barriers to entry that we might look at. So we'll mention a few here. There might be startup costs. So if startup costs are very high, it's clearly going to be difficult for new firms to be able to come in and challenge that dominance of large firms. There might be legal barriers to entry. So, for example, patents might stop new firms from entering the market uh, for, a for a specific product which has been protected by, by the patent. And they usually last for around 20 years. So that stops new firms from being able to produce and sell that product for 20 years. And so that can protect that large firm's dominance. We might also see natural monopolies, which are where the cost of infrastructure in a market is so high 
that it actually becomes unfeasible to have more and large number of competitors within that particular market. So think about markets for broadband. You wouldn't really want to have loads and loads of competitors all in that market, all trying to build broadband cables to all different households. You've got the infrastructure and actually having huge amounts of firms competing for that kind of wouldn't really be too feasible. And then you've also got economies of scale, which can be quite significant barriers to entry as well, because the large firms are going to be able to benefit from those economies of scale because they're producing a much larger amounts of output. Whereas the new entrants to the market who are trying to move into that market are by definition going to be producing at much lower scale and they're not going to be able to benefit from those economies of scale, which is going to make it much harder for them to compete. So the higher those barriers to entry are, the more difficult it's going to be for any new entrants or any smaller firms to challenge the monopoly power of a larger firm in a particular market. Number of competitors is, is a bit more straightforward, I would say. So if you've got more competitors, then there's going to be less likelihood of one firm gaining that degree of monopoly power. So the larger number of competitors there are, the less likelihood there is of that monopoly power of taking hold. Advertising. So the more effective advertising is, the more likely the monopolist is going to be able to increase the brand loyalty for their product. And that actually then becomes a barrier to entry in itself. If you've got really, really strong advertising, which attracts customers and makes them more loyal to you, then any new business entering the market is going to really struggle to compete with that and take customers away from the monopolist. And also, finally, you've got the degree of product differentiation. So the more differentiated a firm can make their product, the more they can make it stand out and make it unique from the competition, the more likely it is they'll be able to develop that monopoly power because customers are more likely to carry on choosing that differentiated and unique product and they're less likely to look at competitors' products instead. So when we're talking about these market structures and when we're talking about the different amounts of power that firms have and the different amounts of competition between different markets, it's really good to know about these concentration ratios. So concentration ratios measure the market share of the N largest firms in an industry. And the reason why we say the N largest firms is because we could do the Two firm concentration ratio, three, four, five, even more than that. So we could do concentration ratios really for any numbers of firms, just looking at the largest firms in that particular industry. And so what you're doing with that is you're just simply adding up the market share of the largest firms for the number of the concentration ratio that you wish to work out. So for example, here, if we wanted to work out in this particular market, we wanted to work out the five firm concentration ratio, we would add up the market share of each of these firms, A, B, C, D, and E. So our five firm concentration ratio in that market would be 97%. The five firm concentration ratio in this different market would also be 97% if we added up all of the market share of those five largest firms. But equally, we could work out the three firm concentration ratio, which for this market would be 80% plus 5% plus 5% and would be 90% concentration ratio, three firm concentration ratio for that market. For this market, our three firm concentration ratio would be 30% plus 25% plus 20%, which would give us a 75% three firm concentration ratio. So these are really good things to work out because they tell us, they act as an indicator for us and give us a good idea for the level of competition within a market. So the more concentrated a market is, and that's a good term to use when you're talking about market structures, the more concentrated a market is, the more dominated it is by a smaller number of large firms. The problem with your concentration ratios is that 
while they give us this good indication, they give us this nice one figure for the level of competition in a market, they tell us nothing really about the relationship between those firms and those largest firms, particularly in the market. So we just saw these two different markets, very, very different markets with very, very different levels of market power by the largest firms. But if we took their five firm concentration ratio, it's 97% for both. So we might draw from that they're very, very similar markets when actually we can see here they're actually very different in their nature. And what it also doesn't tell us about is it doesn't tell us about the conduct of those particular firms in that market. So some markets with very high levels of concentration, firms will collude with each other, which means they kind of work together a little bit to try and reduce the amount of competition between them and to try and keep prices a little bit higher. Whereas in other markets with very, very similar levels of concentration, you'd find that competition could be really, really intense. So it's, an, it's a good initial indicator, but we would need to look in much more depth at that market, at the firms, the relationship with each other and their conduct if we really wanted more detail about a market structure. Coming back now then more specifically to these monopoly markets, it is important for you to be able to evaluate the impact of markets with this sort of market structure. And so starting with the negatives, monopoly markets are going to be seen in quite a negative light in a lot of situations for the market and particularly for the consumers because in contrast to those competitive markets where prices are going to be driven downwards with monopoly markets you're going to be you're going to find very very high prices and that is because of that lack of competition and because the monopolist is going to face highly priced inelastic demand curves because there isn't any alternative because consumers if they want to buy those sorts of products that the monopolist is offering then they have to go to that monopoly firm so markets which have high degrees of monopoly power the monopolist is going to be able to get away with charging those higher prices and that means this diagram here is really actually for the more competitive market but it's a serves as a good point of comparison to the monopoly market because if the monopolist or firm with monopoly power tries to charge that higher price then it's going to find that at that higher price demand is going to be restricted so they will produce a lower output as well so monopoly markets you will find higher prices lower output which is bad news for the consumers in that particular market it also means that the monopolist firm is likely to be more inefficient because they don't have the same incentives of those firms in competitive markets. The great thing about competition is that it encourages firms constantly to be looking where they can make cost savings and where they can try and drive those costs down and improve their efficiency because they're constantly being spurred on by the, the potential for those rivals to take their market share and to push them out of the market. Whereas the monopolist or firm with high degree of monopoly power just doesn't have those same incentives, so they're more likely to be more inefficient. But there are some benefits that monopoly power can bring, not just for the firm, but the, for the consumers in that market as well. So firms that benefit from that level of monopoly power are also likely to be able to benefit from economies of scale because by nature and by definition they're going to be producing on a larger scale of output and what that means is that their cost per unit is likely to be lower so if you see our u-shaped average cost curve here firms in a competitive market are likely to be producing at relatively low levels of quantity low levels of output because of the size of the firm but as firms grow and develop that monopoly power, they increase in the scale of their production and they benefit from those economies of scale. And that may mean even that some consumers in that market might be able to benefit from lower prices as a result of the average cost for that firm being lower. It also means in monopoly markets, firms that are able to make higher profits, 
And that then enables them to invest those profits into research and development and inventing and innovating more extensively. So if you think about the pharmaceuticals market, that would actually be pretty disastrous if it was a really highly competitive market, because that functions by firms making high levels of profits and then the huge cost of research and development and investing in, in the invention and innovation of new drugs, that just wouldn't be possible if those profits weren't there. So monopoly markets enable those higher profits to be made, which if they are then reinvested back into that level of research and development, consumers might see the benefits to that down the line as well.